question. Oh, I was, yes, I was going to be introductory and everything. Well, well, gee whiz, let's see. Uh, so, <laughs> what have you been playing this week, Dengasin? What have you done this week that was fun or that you've enjoyed? Um, I'm still, I don't know if you can see this behind me, I'm still playing Tonkin. Oh, yeah. um, I've now made it to the third of the scenarios. Um, I'm still enjoying this a lot, and I hope to be able to finish probably in three weeks time because I can only ever play at the weekends sure. um, I and I posted something to your to your blog about I saw it. you know I want a series on 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 indo-chinese wars and um, so this was the first one this is great. Um, and so that that was um, something that I really enjoyed because you know you have to do the research you can't just sit there and say okay well there were wars in Indochina because that's a little cheap I also noticed that um, I think two days ago the general who defeated both the French and the later on the Americans um, in Vietnam and General Giap died at the age of 102 uh, he, he this got, weekend, he got, so. an extra, he got, got an extra D one, uh, a, a one D twenty years of life for being yeah. so successful. Isn't that amazing? One hundred and two. Uh, yeah, he was one hundred and two, um, and so I thought that was actually quite interesting as well. You know, because it's happening as as I'm writing about this. Um, yeah, and then I got um, a really really big parcel from Roger McGowan. Um, he sent me five of his C three I magazines. Oh wow. Um, and I've been reading them. Um, so th he sent me some that are, well, kind of, you know, the early ones, or well, not that early, but 200, 2009. It's very different from what they put out 2011 and 12 when they go much more into the background of what does it take to get a war game developed? You know, who are the people? What does the developer do? What does a designer do? Because I had no idea what they were doing and much more background, whereas the older issues are really more about, uh, well, they contain mainly supplements to existing games, right. so, um, you They're know, games. variants and stuff. Yeah, games and... Um, so I've, I've, been, I've been reading those, and they are really, really good. I found a couple of games which I've, I've gotten really interested in. Um, Empire of the Sun is one of them. Apparently there's going to be a reprint, so I ordered that one, because it's a card-driven game that apparently you can play solo. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I've never played a card-driven game, and there's a lot of controver controversy going um, going on about whether you should play card-driven games, and are they real war games, or is it too railroady? And I want to um, I want to see for myself. And it's again Pacific, um, Asia Pacific, and I've never played anything um, of the Pacific era, World War Two. So I decided, you know, this would be something I'd be interested in. Yeah, and that's what I've been up to uh, this week. Um, and also, uh, yeah, um, I ordered another game. I pre-ordered another game um, on GMT. So I've fallen off the bandwagon again. I said, no more games until my first pre-orders were actually going to be delivered. But um, hey, Why you not? know. It's, you don't really pay for it until it's ready. So it doesn't count. Oh, and did we lose our connection? Okay, so the gang's all here. Okay, over to you. Uh, no, no, that's great. So, no, you need to before you finish, uh, before we uh, we talk to Mamie, you need to tell us what you ordered, what you pre-ordered, because we we lost you there for a second. Um, I well, I pre-ordered Empire of the Sun, and I pre-ordered um, and now I forgot what I pre-ordered. It's ridiculous. I ordered it like five minutes ago. Okay, my brain is my brain is completely gone. Um. It was... Um, and it's not early morning there, so you don't have an excuse. No, it's, it's, it's late at night. And, well, it's not late at night, it's 8 o'clock. Well, describe um, it. Describe sorry? it. Describe it. Um, it is a war game by GMT Games. And, um, <laughs> that narrows it down. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, oh, no, um, I don't believe this. World War II, um, by any chance? World War II. It could be World War II. Oh. I'll, I'll have to check. Okay, guys, this is, this is really ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, we're gonna put you on pause. We'll come right back to you. Let's uh, let's talk to Mamie. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mamie, what's been going on this week? Besides, have you, uh, you are you packing and moving? Packing, mainly packing. I just yesterday spent all day, you know, packing up my games, and I'm feeling that sense of anxiety that you know I can't access my games until I move they're all taped up you know ah! <laughs> luckily these little victory point games I can just call in my my handbag and uh, last minute you know. um, That's so I've been packing and uh, 
finishing up my uh, introductory war gaming series with those victory point games, Ziploc bag games. Um, so uh, that was that whole sequence was starting with Strike Force One, and then uh, the arduous beginning, which is actually part of that campaigns in Russia series by uh, Frank Chadwick. And I mm. saw that Gazina had a magazine with the battle for Moscow. So yes. I was looking forward yeah. to her playthrough of that. Uh, and, uh, and what else? So then there was the Drive on Mets by Jim Dunnigan. And then I uh, played Hell's Gate, which I'm most looking forward to returning to, mainly because I screwed up majorly. And it was pointed out to me by the designer. So that, that yeah, definitely uh, makes me want to take that out again. Not only that, it's probably the game that I enjoyed the most from that series. And then I, I topped it off with uh, Paul Koenig's D-Day, which I still have yet to post. <laughs> um, and I have a bunch of games lined up that I'm dying to get to. Um, lower complexity or maybe a little bit Maybe it might be a bigger step that I'm ready for, mm -hmm. um, but I'm trying, like Gazina, wanting to try out different mechanics, like card-driven. I have uh, Age of Napoleon, that's like a area movement, card-driven, strategic level game. I have um, uh, a House Divided, which uh, wow. is point, uh, has a point-to-point -point wow. point movement, also strategic. The entire Civil War, American Civil War. Um, and I have, uh, and that's also a Frank Chadwick game. Um, and uh, I wanted to check out what this area impulse thing was about with uh, Warriors of God um, that also has kind of an area movement type uh, map layout. Um, and then a victory denied, uh, of course. Um, Ta-da. Can't forget those, that hex, those hexes and counters. Um, and then uh, there was, oh yes, of course, Fading Glory, which is probably one of the, the first ones that I'll get into of that list. So a lot, a lot of games lined up. <laughs> yeah, you have a lot of stuff lined up. That's interesting. Yep. <laughs> so, so we have Vietnam on one side, and we have pretty much the gamut of in the entire civilized, known civilized time period, right? <laughs> on your <Yeah>. side, <laughs> everything from Napoleonic all the way back, to, all all the way through to World War Two. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm really drawn to um, uh, revolutionary and civil wars. Mm. So uh, Napoleonic's American Civil War. Very cool. Interesting. Very cool. Well, that's awesome. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I so I was uh, had a crazy week this week uh, as well. I had uh, a quick conversation with Emanuele, the uh, the Vento, Vento Nuovo games designer guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see the t-shirt? This is one of my yeah. favorite. It's a freebie. I'm like, and I can see the box behind <laughs> you. Oh, man. What's that behind it's, you? It says the big board on it. He had a oh. it with my name oh. on it. So, he sent that to you. That's sweet. <laughs> Isn't that cool? So he sent me all these T-shirts and stuff, and the game is out. And uh, yeah, it's. I gotta huge. check out your video. Yeah, it's really big and it's beautiful, just just gorgeous. And uh, just sort of all maps together, and you can put the east front and west front together, and mm. you know, look at all of World War Two and its glory. And it's a block game, so it's not hard. So it's very cool. So I'm excited about that. And then, to, just to keep things complicated, I started playing on Vassal with a guy by the name of Bill, uh, um, an OCS game called the Blitzkrieg Legend, which is mm. all about the uh, 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 the uh, Case Yellow, where the Germans invade Germany and Bel uh, invade Germany, invade France and Belgium. It would be very difficult mm. to invade Germany, but they could if they wanted to. Uh, so they uh, they in invade France and Belgium and Holland the first turn on Vassal, because you're not moving pieces around, you're dragging counters and looking at stacks and things, but it took me six hours. Mm. Now, I've played the game by myself, and I got about three turns done in six hours. So I was just, Friday, I just, after I'd done that one turn, I was exhausted. I was like, oh, I need a nap. <laughs> <laughs> so that's been basically my gaming week. The whole week has been taken up goofing around with this, silly vassal thing which is fantastic for games if you can't play with someone but mm. wow it did, with big games it really took a lot of time but anyway that's uh, that's really been my week I haven't done much else so so this vassal games where the turns take forever your the other player sits there real time watching you you can do that or you can do uh, you just do it by email and we're doing it by email and I think that's part of the problem is that I'm you know when you're 
when you're playing with people and you're both physically there, you can offer each other advice and opinions and try and mm. help. But this game, in the, op the opening two turns, the Germans, it just takes them forever to do everything because there's so many choices and you're weaving your way through all these little roads and towns and trying to make mm. the most of the first two turns that you have because they're kind of critical to the whole game, right? <laughs> And so you're doing it by email and you don't want to make mistakes because you go through it all and you've got to back it all out uh, just by reversing and everything goes back to where it was and then you start again and it gets really confusing for the other dude. He's looking going, well, that's wrong. And then you back it all out. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that's like watching that a movie. Bring me, that brings me to the question of take backs. Like yeah. what? what's <laughs> faux pas? Like, is it when you lift your finger off the counter, like in chess? Yeah, or? <laughs> that's a that's a good point. And so with Vassal, I think it's kind of a, it's kind of a free for all, or, or or you just because you're doing it by yourself, I guess you could just stop it, delete it, and start over. But with six hours, or even in chunks of two hours, I'm not going to delete it. So I just go back and I just put a note in and say, look, dude, I screwed up. <laughs> I you know. He can't actually get to that spot, so I'm going to move it back. But that type of thing. But what do you do? What, what do you, have you played any games with anyone that you can make a comment on? What 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 are your rules for even in a Euro game? What's your what's your rule for uh, take backs? Um, I'm pretty lenient. Uh, like uh, we just you know we just call a roll back, and right. you know it. Of course, it has to be within one turn. Sure. Uh, <laughs> it depends on the game also, but I I'm pretty lenient. I just, I didn't know if there were a majority of players who were very competitive. I guess right. it just depends on how competitive you are. Like if yeah. I have, if I've wagered my cat, then I will be very competitive and not let you <laughs> roll back. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Gassine? Have you played with anyone where you've done, you've done uh, take backs or roll backs um, or how do you play it? I, 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 I'm also quite lenient. Um, when I'm playing against myself I really kind of you know when, when I make a mistake I'm like oh well sorry you know um, I just fired at the wrong stack so now they're gonna butcher me but that's you know when I'm playing against myself I'm really hard on myself right you know I kind of say okay if this was a real war and I just basically unfortunately attacked the wrong the wrong army and they're now um, waltzing all over me then I'll just have to live with it it's my problem <laughs> but funny. if I play with other people I'm very lenient because um, it's more like I want I want everybody to enjoy themselves sure. and if you then and if I make a stupid mistake and I kind of realize okay this is going to put me in a really stupid um, situation everybody will notice this too and they'll go oh well you know right. you didn't mean to do this so go back and I would do the same I mean especially also in role playing because now I'm GMing for for a group and um, in the in the second session one of the characters died <laughs> so that's really like that's the end they would have to to create a new one I was like yeah well you know I'm going to give you a fate point you can come back you will give you you'll get an affliction you won't look the same but you know you don't have to go through everything backstory and reconstruct yourself because that's that's right. going to get take ages so because I don't know. I don't think I'm really competitive. I want everybody to have a good time. Right. Well, um, yeah, that's cool. That's good though. That's that's uh, fair. I, we where when I play face to face with guys here, we, depending on what the game is, if both of us know the game really well, mm. usually with one guy I play with Peter, it's competitive, and there's no oh. hints, there's no help, there's no take backs, there's unless you. I mean, you know, unless you make a mistake or whatever, you, you, or you say, hey, look, you know, I forgot to move this guy, can I move this guy? And, and we look at it that if it's not going to materially change the game, then that's cool. For instance, when we play Lock and Load, uh, Forgotten Heroes, uh, the Vietnam stuff, we, you know, it's, we both know the game really well. And so it's, it's, yeah, sure, you can do that, you can't do that. Or, but if we're playing and it's, it's a game and we're playing, there's no take backs. There's no no forgiveness. There's no love. I'm sorry. No, that die. That, that die is a cock die. You're gonna have to re-roll that guy. So you know we will often do stuff like that. But um, I, I I always try and err on the side of history. Whatever would have happened historically, for instance, if I do something stupid in a game, I'm playing by myself or whatever, then I'll I'll say okay, I shouldn't have done that. I should have done this. So I'll take it all back or take some of it back and kind of go down that path. I noticed on your last uh, DAC video that you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, yeah, you were talking about um, 
kind of rolling back, changing a few things, and moving on. Yes. And I thought that was, I mean, a, a game that massive, uh, that yeah. makes sense. You know? Oh, yeah. Because, I well, there's so much more game in that uh, particular play that I, I'm playing that, you know, I wanted, I wanted to see how the Commonwealth conducted itself with its massive counter-offensive and all the rest of it on the, I still had all these pieces that I punched out and clipped and got all organized and I had not used them yet. I'm thinking, hmm, this is gonna be over in three turns if we do this. And clearly I've not, I've made some mistakes. So let's wind it all back and we'll have at it again and see what happens. And, and I won't spoil what happens, but um, it, it's interesting. So anyway, um, yeah, so take backs are fun sometimes. Uh, when you play with a new person, I think that's always a challenge too. If someone is, uh, you're trying, you want to teach them and help them, but you don't want to play the game for them. You know, mm -hmm. I've played with some folks face to face where you're kind of playing the game for them, and, and you want to mm. help, help them, but you're not. Uh, you don't want to be. Well, you should move this guy to this place because this is the best place. You want to just kind of give them ideas, and if they don't catch on, then oh well. What can you yeah. do, right? So what else? What's been, what's what's the what's the latest in cat world? Uh, I well, we had a rabies shot yesterday, so we're kind of pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're all, they're all good, um, but then again, they're not moving. So ha have you told yours already that they're going to move to a new house? They they have no clue. They've never really experienced a move, you know. Um, and so, but they're having a great time with the boxes, you know. And uh, I had a, a stuffed uh, pink stuffed die, like a dice, um, mm -hmm. that I found. And I was looking around, and I saw that uh, Luca, my little kitten, he was playing with the die, rolling it around, and I was so proud of him. <laughs> you got well, he's you learning. Got he's learning fast. Rolling dice, it's great. <laughs> um, I, 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 I meant to say something. Um, okay, now I forgot what I wanted to say. <laughs> okay. You, you have a real well, I don't know what is wrong with me tonight, but I can tell you the game that I ordered. It's called Fire in the Lake, and it's from the coin uh, series like Andean Abyss. Yes. It's an area impulse game yes. set in Vietnam because yep. I wanted to kind of add it because that's a mechanic that I haven't played before. And I read about it in those in those C three I magazines. Mm -hmm. um, about how the how they work and it sounded so fascinating and um, I know Jason Young is also going to buy it so maybe we will actually be able to play it on Vassal together or something so I pre-ordered that one as well. Oh that'll be fun. The coin series is really cool. Mm -hmm. I, I like the idea of it. I, I just have not found one of the titles that I really enjoy that much. I, I tried the Labyrinth game and, mm -hmm. um, and until you really have played it several times and know all the cards and what they can and can't do, yeah. you're kind of fishing around kind of blindly, which can be fun, but then once you know the game, then you know the cards, and then it's like, okay, well, I'm going to do A, B, and C, and I win. And so for a solo game, I didn't find it particularly enjoyable, mm -hmm. but I think with Mark Herman involved uh, that, and the breadth and scale of the whole Vietnam conflict, I think that's going to be a, a really interesting yeah. title to play. Yeah, that's cool. Is that a, a four-player kind of... A made for four player type of I game. I think it is, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it, I, I, think, I think the funny thing about it is they have made it into a one to four player game. That was the idea from the very beginning. They have, um, you can play it solo in two ways. Either you use the AI, which they ha which they deliver with the actual game, mm -hmm. so it's it, it works through flowcharts, or you can just say, you know, you're gonna play all four factions in, in one go like you would in a solo war game yeah. um, and so I'm really um, I'm really intrigued by this because um, again this is a mechanic that you know I'm completely unused to I've never played any such game so and I I mean the Andean Abyss one that's about uh, the Colombian drug war and it doesn't interest me at all so if I'm yeah. going to play a game and use a mechanic that I've never used before it helps me if it's a if if it's a topic that I'm interested in. Yeah, I've heard not, I've heard not very good things. Well, I shouldn't say not very good things. <laughs> it's a fine game, right? But yeah. I've find I've found very few people who are excited about the topic. And the, and there's another coin game called Cuba Libra, which is about the liberation yeah. of Cuba, liberation of Cuba, 
people are like, oh, I don't really care about that one either, but there's lots of interest about uh, a distant plane that's set in Afghanistan. Yes. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the fire on the lake. I'm sorry, I cut you off there, Mamie, what were you going to say? No, no, I mean, I, I just, um, because oh. I just um, watched uh, Jason Young's videos on a distant plane. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so he just uh, put, put on a series on YouTube, and I thought, okay, and he, he had actually served in Iraq. Um, so, you know, for him, this was like, you know, a lot of his buddies would say this is way too close to home. They would never play such a game. But for him, it's like he could actually relate to it on a level that, you know, I could never relate to right, a game. Right. Um, That's interesting. And he just he just made the, the whole mechanic look really intriguing and really, okay, well, I completely understand how this game works. And he yeah. only played it solo as well. Um, or I think he may have played it with Kalandale. I think, yeah, he did. The, the two of them played it together as well. Um, and I thought, okay, I can relate to the mechanics. I saw it played in in a video, so kind of I know how this works. Oh, that's and cool. now I just need a now I just need a, a topic that I'm interested in. And then I saw fire in the lake, and I thought, okay, well, yeah, um, well, that looks ties interesting. Right into, it ties right into your Vietnam. Uh, so yeah, it does. It does. And apparently, I mean, it went to 1,000 pre-orders on P500 in like the space of two months. Yeah, so it's yeah, it was quick. Really popular. Yeah. So we'll see how that goes. So what what else what else is going on, Mamie? What what else is new with you? Have you met any more famous uh, people in the last few weeks? I mean, you've been, you know, who are you rubbing shoulders with these all days? All the time, all the time, Kev. Yeah, like you every know, day. Uh, all you guys get all this stuff sent. You, you know, and now I'm not going to complain about the t-shirt, right? I get a t-shirt that's probably about, the t -shirt. about two sizes too small for me, but I'm wearing it, you know. But um, and I, it's just an extra large, which says how big Italian people are, right? So this is an extra large, and it's so. And I'm not a, I mean, I'm not a big guy, but I'm 200 pounds, and this is a cozy T-shirt. So, uh, so you're not rubbing shoulders with anyone famous this week. You didn't catch up with Frank, or you know, Richard Berg didn't drop in and say hi and have coffee you know, <laughs> while he was over on the east west coast or something, anything like that. The famous designer uh, of the of the week that I meet up with. No, um, <laughs> we need to have a designer of the week <laughs> session. <laughs> Well, there's Mark uh, Mazicki. Yes. Um, he's a local, yes. and uh, he's su he's uh, just super busy uh, with uh, Operation Dauntless, um, mm -hmm. and he has a million other games going on at the same time in his head. And you know, the guy works at an incredible speed, and uh, he's so passionate, and charged. Um, but he's he's definitely. Uh, you know, it welcome op open to to meeting up and playing some games. You know, any kind. You know, uh, introductory level games. He said he would be willing to to meet up and and play some of that That's low cool. complexity stuff. So, because when he designed Red Winter, he said he meant for it to be an introductory war game. It's just that with so much research came so much more complexity. Yeah. He kind of missed that bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was as simple as he can get that topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's cool, though. Well, good. Now, you, you did you, uh, you really didn't give us any update on the cats, and we are concerned, you know, with the move. Are we losing hair, or is anything going on? You keep looking up, uh, up, up, up high. <laughs> this is your fault. Oh, by the way, you're going to Italy. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, yeah we'll talk hello, about that oh, look at that Yuli. little pumpkin. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I'm not. I, I'm camera shy. Look how how much does that cat weigh? I think um probably at over twelve pounds by now. I was gonna say now. that's a twelve pound cat. He's that not cat. even full grown. These things get huge. They're uh, males weigh about twenty twenty to twenty five pounds when they're full grown. He's still a baby. Oh, He's uh, almost three, two and a half. Okay. <laughs> they grow till they're five, so. Oh God. I'm, um, I'm glad mine isn't growing anymore. I mean, he's he's now five kilos, 5.3 kilograms, and um, that's 10, 10 German pounds, so that's. <sighs> and yours is 20. Well, no, 12, 12 still. 12 pounds, oh, not 12 okay. kilos. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, would be good. That would be a good cat. <laughs> We have a 12 pound cat and we call it Fatty. We don't have cool names like you guys do. Um, we have Blackie, Fatty, and Nugget. Aren't we original? <laughs> Nugget. <laughs> and then you have, you have dogs, don't you? You have and dogs two, as and, well. And two dogs. And, and uh, we had three chickens, but we just gave one away because it became a rooster. Oh. It matured into a rooster. Yeah, I hate when that happens. <laughs> 
Yeah, the first time at Cockadoodle Dude, I, I, we put a, an ad on Craigslist, and within about forty-five minutes, we had people. Hey, I'll take the rooster. I've got, I've got hands. I need a rooster. So, so mm. great. It's all yours. So yeah, I'm going to Italy on November twenty. Yes. Tell us all about that. Uh, well, I found out this morning. Uh, it was a big surprise from my wife and children, and they. Uh, um, they had organized, they, they said, you know, because I refused to have a birthday party. I'm not a big birthday party guy. I don't, I've never really had birthday parties or celebrated my birthday. And so my wife's like, you are absolutely doing something special for your birthday. You're 50. And I was like, I know, but I don't care. It's okay. It's, we just have dinner with some friends and do what we would normally do. And so she says, no, we're doing something special. So she had tried to talk me into going on a trip to Italy and uh, I just said like, you know, it's too much money, you don't want to go, I'm busy with work and let's not, you know, playing games and I like my little office, I don't want to go anywhere. Uh, but uh, so I'm going to Italy and uh, I'm taking my oldest son with me, uh, Davis, so he's 13 and he's super excited because he, he's into history, he's not as into it perhaps as I am. But we're going to go to Rome for uh, five days and then to Florence wow. for two or three days. And then I'm going to Milan and I'm going to go see Emanuele and we're going to go hang out for a day with him and then fly back. So it's pretty, a it's pretty quick trip, but my intention is to uh, try and find some of the more out of the way historical bits and pieces and uh, statues and things to, that are more tied back to the historical wargaming than just a picture of the Colosseum. I mean, we've all seen that and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, and I've been to Italy a couple of times before, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited to be going back, but I really want to make this more about a historical uh, visit than a vacation visit. If uh, I went with my wife, for instance, because she went to Paris in, uh, over the summer with a girl, stayed with a girlfriend over there for free. And she said, well, you should come and we'll do your 50th birthday then. And I said, great, because there's all these really cool battlefields and if we could just go here and I know your friend lives there and we'll do this. And she's like, oh, we're so not doing that. We're going to cafes and we're eating food and I'm going shopping. <laughs> I said, oh, well, I don't have any interest in doing that. I'm 50, I don't do that anymore. Uh, so shopping is, I don't shop anymore. I wear free t-shirts. So. <laughs> So wait, when is this? November when is this 21st. Uh, That's your birthday? Uh, well, my birthday's uh, tomorrow, the 7th. <gasps> Happy birthday! Yeah, so uh, so uh, November 21st I leave and we'll, uh, we'll be back on the 1st of December. Wow. Yeah. That's I'm, really cool. Yeah, it's really exciting. 13. I think I was 13 the first time I, I traveled to, to Italy in that area. It's a great age to, to mm. travel. Yes. You know, any younger and you're not as, as interested necessarily. Right. Mm. Yeah, the, the cool thing was he didn't know anything about it. He knew that I was going on a trip. He didn't know that he was going to go. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, so when he saw that, uh, my wife gave me this really cool little printed itinerary and a, a mobile app for my phone to, you know, uh, with all of like a pre kind of sort of pre-planned itinerary itinerary here's some things you could do that are all historically related so it was really very thoughtful uh gift and uh then the last piece of paper in there was a framed picture of davis and i looked at her and she said yeah he's going too and he went oh wow and the first thing out of his mouth was can we go to the vatican city so we're going to go to the vatican city as well so he's he's got some interest which is nice he might want to check out the catacombs Mm. Yeah, I bet you he would find that exciting, right? That would be interesting. Yeah, loads of dead people <laughs> and um, loads of graffiti dating back two thousand years. I mean, it's it's seriously. I'm, I'm not kidding you. I, I saw I saw a film about it the other day um, on BBC, um, and I was like, okay, if I was going to Rome, that's where I would be heading um, at least for half a day. Um, <clears throat> because it's 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 different um, burial grounds, you know, of different even kind of like religions. You have the old Roman, the old Romans used it. Then the Christians came in, um, and uh, yeah, yes. it's uh, I mean Rome. Wow, I've never yeah. been. So hey, it'll I'm be envious. fun. It'll be fun. And so I, I'm hoping yeah. to see uh, as a statue of uh, Pompey, General Pompey, mm. on his horse. Uh, I'm, okay. Uh, I'm keen. I've got to look up that again and find out where that is. I want to go uh, get some uh, personal images of that. 
and because uh, I did a whole series on Caesar versus Pompeii uh, mm, yeah. with, with the Great Battles of History, so that was yeah, cool. Uh, so I want to see that, and I really have enjoyed uh, read it several times, but Marcus Aurelius's writings. So I want to uh, go find out as much uh, uh, locally there about him as I can, and see what what they have in the museums and bits and pieces about him so that'll be cool uh, i think he's a was a great philosopher emperor so um it's cool stuff anyway so yeah that's enough about my stuff that's what i'm doing that's my birthday present so it's you have to take plenty of pictures and post them all i will i'll try and i actually try and uh, uh so a friend of mine is giving my son a camera uh, a uh a, i've got you know this uh, samsung uh, phone that i use mm. for my pictures uh, he's got a spare one, so he's going to give that to my son, Davis, and uh, so we'll we'll uh, we'll take some serious pictures, but we'll be goofing around, making videos, and doing things, and I, uh, live live post them all. When I went uh, on that trip, when I was his age, I, I had a a journal and just took notes of everything that I saw, what what I ate that morning, what I ate that afternoon, and looking back on it today, I still have it. Isn't that it, cool? It definitely brings back memories. I, I highly recommend he does that. Um, just taking notes day to day, what what he does, yeah. what he sees, what he experiences, and uh, yeah, I think that's it'll be especially with the photos because back then I, I didn't have, I don't think there was much digital photography, <laughs> so I didn't really have that. But just yeah. just just five just five or six years ago, there wasn't digital photography. <laughs> <laughs> you're our baby, uh, you're our baby war gamer. <laughs> I'm 30, 31. Are you really? Okay. Oh, oh God. I mean, now, I remember being 31, you know. We have, to edit that we, have, we have decade of experience added on top of here. A decade here, a decade there. Easy. I mean, we're representing three different decades Easy. here. Easy there. Or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disconnect this video right now. <laughs> uh, hey, so, you know, you know what he said he was going to do is uh, he wants to... Um, he wants to take a picture of every meal. He's really into food and cooking. Oh, and, uh, wow, cool. So, so we'll do that, <laughs> so that'll be fun. He said, Dad, do you think, <laughs> he, he goes, Dad, do you think they'll have good pasta? And then he goes like this. <sighs> he gives me the big oh. eye roll, you know. <laughs> totally, totally kidding. So you anyway, should, wait, well, that was cool. Wait, tell him that, that uh, when you order pizza, it's, it's per person, a whole pizza pie yeah. is an individual's good dinner. Tip. Good tip, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's that's cool. Well, I'm excited about that. So you know what I do have set up that's interesting. Uh, while I'm trying to set it up, I I clipped, uh, I punched and clipped all the counters, and uh, <laughs> misread the counter labels because there's so many different tokens, uh, you know, pieces of information on the counters. It's War of the Suns, and I sorted it uh, by stacking point instead of by turn of entry. Oh oh oh! oh my God. <laughs> There's a thousand counters, and it's yeah. I'll just check this out. So, oh, see, my heart's bleeding. I'm crying That's, inside. There's, there's three oh, of counters over there, and I'm just so pissed. <laughs> so all this morning, I've been sitting there going, "Oh look, this is not a five; it's a 14. Um, oh man! Sometimes I'm such a dumbass. No and one each knows. time you have to sort, it's that much more likely you'll lose a, a counter. Yeah, It'll exactly. fall from the exactly. table or something. Yeah, especially the way of my oh wife comes around the house. <laughs> so, I uh, mean, what I would be interested in is actually um, War of the Suns. Would you tell us more about the game? Because I saw the I saw the the picture of the maps. It's 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 uh -huh. not just one map, and I saw the the rage against the machine exploration thingy. Do you like that? <laughs> I I thought it was great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's my Angry Man music. <laughs> <laughs> So the the cool thing about the cool thing about the game is that uh, beautiful beautiful big box, right? Uh, I don't know if you guys can let me just uh, change this so I can see what you are seeing. Uh, it's the map of basically all of China and parts of Burma, and where the the border reaches and all that sort of stuff. And as you can see, it's fairly complicated. Uh, it gets right up there on the high complexity scale, and I think that's it's. I can't really say how complicated it is. I've read the rules twice, uh, and, I, and I don't think it's going to be that bad, but it's there's a lot to it. And the reason why there's a lot to it is there's just so much information on um, a given counter that you've really got to 
be paying attention. And I think it's a lot of, uh, the theme is all about, uh, from 1939 through 45, the, the entire uh, conflict between uh, China and Japan. And so mm. there's, there's a lot of political uh, motivations behind all this. There's a lot of, uh, you know, interfighting between the uh, Kuomintang and, uh, you know, the communists and then all the mm. clans and cliques. And uh, they have a different name for the clans. They call them something else as well. But uh, then I'm forgetting off the top of my head. But uh, basically, you you could be a three-player game if you wanted it to be. Mm. So it's pretty interesting. There's a thousand pieces and three maps. And the maps are gorgeous, big hexes. Uh, I don't know how well you can see that or not. But you can mm. see there's a lot of data on each counter. There's green. Uh, that's not focused. Come on, buddy. Stick your hand behind it. Like that? Oh, yeah. yeah. You've done that before. A little better. There we go. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. Yeah. So there's, but there's, uh, you know, different colored boxes for, it, you know, you see that's got a one color box and then this guy's got a, <laughs> a black stripe across the bottom. I got to remember what that's for. And there's ones with white stripes across the, the, the bottom and there's, uh, the different clans they belong to. There's number. There's the uh, abbreviations for those. So there's uh, just a lot to it. There's an air war and a naval <laughs> war and ec economic things. And um, I think it's going to be really interesting. And I'm just I'm going to play a little two turn scenario to see what it's like. Uh, trying to get a feel for the mechanics <coughs> of the game. It's a chip pull based thing. So you chip pull, but then you have. Um, rules around the chip pool so if someone gets too many then they have you start rolling dice for things and there's all sorts of little uh tricky <laughs> tricky bits and pieces to the game that uh that make it involved i think is perhaps a good word for it mm -hmm. maybe not complicated but involved uh, who's the designer oh it's adam starkweather captain captain complicated so uh, <laughs> is he the same guy who did the um most dangerous yeah. game. Yeah, yeah, the most dangerous game, the most dangerous time, or whatever it is. Uh, no, yes, he did that one. <laughs> um, and he's, but he's also designed some great uh, games like uh, uh, The Devil's Cauldron and uh, Where Eagles Dare. And he's got some new stuff out, and that's all company level stuff. This, I, I think he was working, I want to say he was working with an Asian designer. Uh, I'm not sure and and I think some of the problems with some of the games that I've not liked of his have been that they're trans translated titles so it's not just it's not just the, the game it's translated from Japanese and then perhaps he's played it so many times that he gets the wording but when you go sit down and try and read it mm. the, the feeble-minded of us uh, have challenges mm. so anyway what can I say? So that's War of the Suns, and you know that kind of fits into that whole chronological exercise yeah. that we're we're talking about. So that'll kick off the Pacific Theater for me, uh, starting in thirty nine. At some point, when I get to play the campaign, if I if I play the campaign, if I can if I can bear to sort all those counters again. So <laughs> anyway, so that's you know that's all I've been I've been working on that, and I played play this Vassal game this week really sucked up a lot of my time. So. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I played a little bit of the Russian campaign and finished that up with a massive German loss because they went all out to try and capture Moscow and failed. And uh, and what else did I finish up? Oh, and I finished that 1809 from Kevin mm. Zucker, uh, the the Napoleonic's era battle. That was lots of fun. I really enjoyed that game a lot more than the first game in the series of those that I played. Uh, so, so I was very excited about that. It's a cool strategic level, core level um, representation of Napoleonic conflict. So that was cool. Gazina, didn't you pick up a game from that series, or was that? I, did. I think it's the one that he liked less. 1806. <laughs> oh yeah, but that's a great. <laughs> but no, that's a great. That's a great <laughs> game. The first time. Rossbach avenged. Yeah, Rossbach avenged. The first time I played it. I didn't really understand uh, enough about what was going on in that time historically with mm. the 
the evolution of command because command was changing so rapidly there they went from this concept of bunches and bunches of regiments to consolidating them into divisions and then mm. then they said well geez if we get uh, a bunch of divisions together and consolidate them we can make a thing called a core and if we have a core that's a self-sustaining army and it won't get shattered or blown up or destroyed like that whereas two or three divi a division or two by itself could Mm. So the biggest battles that ever occurred in the uh, Napoleonic era up until that time were 40, 50,000 guys at a time. Yeah. And now if you had these cores, you can got three or four roads in an area, they can all travel down a road each and they're all self-sustaining and they can survive long enough to get a message out to somebody else to get another core to come and support them. So it, was, it became this massive, uh, that changed the whole concept of maneuver and you know uh, forcing you could force the issue whereas in the past when you're in a war with someone both sides could say okay well you outmaneuver me I, I run away you win and then they kind of sign a peace treaty well now you can actually get to the point and outmaneuver people and make them fight on terms that they didn't want to fight on and on terrain they mm. might not want to fight on so um conflicts became more deadly and the use of force became uh was more concentrated and it was really really interesting time and all the administrative stuff that had to happen to, with all that changed as well so it's kind of cool stuff anyway that's really boring so we'll cut all that out but that's that's uh that's oh, come uh, on. <laughs> no, well it's i i think it's really fascinating but you yeah know, yeah it's uh, but, but 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 i think i think this is what what the hobby is about because I've been reading um, The Mask of Command, uh -huh. um, and this is exactly what he describes when he talks about warfare in the different eras, you know, how Alexander would have been kind of like saying, okay, I'm going to take command of the, um, of, of, of my elite um, uh, cavalry, yes. and then, but basically then he just leads them into battle, and then everybody else needs to fend for themselves. Yes, right. there is a plan, but as soon as he is in the battle there is nothing he can do to influence the rest of his army thousands of people because he's just you know right. attacking himself and then you have the um, you have the 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 contrast with um uh with the battle of waterloo where um the the general the english general actually does not really lead his men into battle but he rides he rides from one area to the next and back and forth and back and forth and just basically instructs all of his sub-commands, okay, so this is what we're going to be doing now, or you need help here, I'm going to get help. So he was more like, not really an errand boy, but he kept he kept an overview over what was going yes. on and then he rode to the different commanders and told them exactly what to do based on the knowledge that he just gotten first hand right, um, right because there was no there was no long distance communication you right, know very and i just thought this was so interesting because i was struggling with the gboh rules of caesar taking command i was like this doesn't make sense i don't get this at all so i, I chose to play sgboh um right. instead because the command structure is much much more simplified and as i was reading the book i was like oh that's what they were trying to do yeah. That's how the Caesar issuing line command or you know whoever the general commander is issuing line commands really means and this is the historical parallel to it. And it suddenly made sense. Um, yeah, and I, I think, I think it makes to it me much... this is not boring at all. I think this is why this is why, why why I was so annoyed that I got this 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 Vietnamese thing wrong because I didn't get it that you could actually plant the the Viet Minh um, in the heartland of the French and its infiltration, because he doesn't call it that, he just says, you know, you disperse them, like, okay, whatever that means. But it's like he can put them in a French controlled hex. Ah, right, right, right. Okay. Then, cool. then, they, have to, then they have to move um, two hexes away from this or within the two hexes of the French controlled hex, but they can basically be recruited there. You know, that's the only type of, of unit that can be recruited in a foreign, foreign controlled area. Because it's this idea of infiltration. Huh. Very cool. And see that. So that. So that. That's very historical, right? And very. Yeah. That they're capturing. When I say it's boring, I, I guess you know I I I've been on this mission for a year and a half trying to work out the difference mm. between the classical command that you've experienced with Caesar and mm. the Napoleonic command, 
and when this concept of operational art of warfare really took place. So with Mamie's playing of some of her games where you've got the, uh, the, the larger tank armies and battles going on with the, what was the one that you just played, Hell's Gate, right? So you're, yeah. you're, you're trying, the, the, the way that the armies that moved then in that period versus how they moved in the Napoleonic era, that was the, the genesis of, of what transpires in that period that you're playing with, Mamie. And it, but there was this breaking point with the classical era where command changed and these command staffs were developed and the idea of these cores were created and mm -hmm. yeah, lots of technological change. And I thought it was all technology driven, but it really wasn't. It was uh, administratively driven, which is kind of fascinating and logistically driven as well. But anyway, like I said, I, it's interesting, but I'm not sure that uh, I would watch a video of me talking about it for 20 minutes so i'll stop the, anyway. uh, the waterloo example is a really good one uh, i haven't dealt with command in any of the games that i'm playing yet really uh, but that's a really good example it makes me think of you know the communication and and mm -hmm. the messaging the the relaying of of mess of command of messages and and the time that that takes meanwhile things are changing mm -hmm. and uh, and a lot of times there's confusion between uh, if who you're if you're receiving messages from two different sources uh, you know let's say your immediate commander and and your general uh, who, who you know who has the more accurate picture of what's mm -hmm. going on what's more urgent do you default to the higher up in, in the chain of command and and things like that and and, and Waterloo is an example of, of those issues yeah uh, from what I've read well that book no, I, I, I find it I find that totally fascinating actually there is one when I was watching this video I was thinking of you Kevin there is um a very good film about um, the seminal battle that the Australians fought in Vietnam um, and it took place in one night and you know it was it was actually quite dramatic and loads of people um, lost their lives um, and um, and they, they interviewed veterans who had been there mm -hmm. and just you know to realize what it meant when the guy who was carrying the radio was hit and the radio was destroyed they were like it was dark we had no idea where we are I mean to a certain extent we did know but not right. that detailed and we had no idea where the enemy was unless they were firing at us so they were completely relying on information from other from other areas and once this information was lost and it's like yeah this is and they, they didn't have any command structure anymore they were just you know saying okay the only thing we could do was basically huddle together get everybody in in, in such a small um, circle that they could see each other at night in the dark um, huh. to just basically hold that position and that is the, the smallest unit of command you can have that you can actually talk to the person next to you otherwise right. everything would have fallen apart and then um, and then you know they withdrew and there was a lot of toing and froing but I thought this was so interesting because at HQ they were trying to figure out what the situation with this group was and they thought have they all died they had no information either you know so will we send in the artillery, but if we do, we might actually bombard our own men. And I thought this was just so interesting about communication and command. Mm -hmm. And what do you do if you're, they call them sun rays, those were their, their commanders. What do you do if, if he's down, you know, because one of them died. And I thought this was very interesting. Huh. So that was that the Battle of Lontan? I was just looking at the uh, um, online. Is that, is that, is that um, um, a rubber plantation? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure that. Yeah, it was in eight, 18th of August, 1966. Uh, Possibly, yeah. It, yeah. it was. It was. A, it was a huge. It was a huge and important battle that the right. Australians fought. Right. Um, and there's a really good video. It, it, it's, it's actually a, a whole documentary, and you can see it on YouTube. In YouTube, it's it's very interesting. Oh, okay. Very well. Then I see. Uh, is it a long video or is it a yeah one point uh, one hour forty seven minutes okay cool no just I'm seeing a list of videos here and I just I'll have to check them out after after we're done I, I'm go I'm gonna send you the link to the one cool um because it's actually very good it's it's a documentary it's an Australian documentary sure cool okay excellent yeah what else I have a question uh, go ahead you man. both played a lot of this game this series called Great Battles of History yes. <laughs> 
and and each <laughs> uh, each each box contains uh, several scenarios, many scenarios, yes. what five five to ten, oh, let's at least, say mm. at least, yeah. yeah, yeah. When you when you play uh, when you decide to play uh, one of those games, uh, one of those installments, do you make it a point to play through all of the scenarios uh, together, or do you just pick a scenario, put it back on the shelf? go to the next game. I mean, is there is there because you're investing time to refresh yourself on the rules mm -hmm. and you're immersing mm -hmm. yourself in that period, um, is it pro is it common to get sucked into to one installment for many months and then <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll to let, try to uh, get through all the scenarios? Right, I'll let uh I'll let Cassine answer first. I, I don't know if it's common, but I kind of um, use this as a way of really learning it. So I start with the easy ones, you know, because they will always say, okay, so this is an introductory scenario, so I play this. And then I will keep playing all of them, um, except for everything that is sea battles, because I'm not interested at all. But um, uh, I, I really stick with them, um, because I, yeah, like you, like you said, you invest yourself in the rules, and... Um, and it's just, um, to me, I, I'm not finished until I'm finished. Um, right. I don't know. I mean, Infidel, I couldn't, I couldn't stop. I could not have stopped without playing the last one of them because I just wanted to see, to see each one of them because the way they designed them, or at least the ones that I've played, is that there is something new or different about every scenario that you don't find in the others. You know, one might have a siege element or... Right. There is one in Infidel. I don't know if you remember which one that is. Um, it's the one where they, where you actually have a luggage train that then is going to be attacked. So that's something you don't usually have. Where the, where the where the where the Crusaders actually just want to leave the map. They don't want to engage the the in, the, um, the the Muslim factions. They just basically need to get off the map. So that's very different from actually two armies clashing. Um, and and I think this is this is the idea that they have behind it that each time you have to you have the same mechanic with a little twist. That's the impression that I get. This is how they right. select them. So I would stick yeah, with them. It's, it's interesting because the uh, I, I don't know the um, some of the battles. If you go you look at Alexander the Great, for example. So Alexander the Great, um, Great Battles of Street Deluxe Version, whatever it is. It's got. 10 or 11 different scenarios in it, 85% of them are entirely one-sided debacles that Alexander's going to crush the person mm. just because he has such significant advantages, he's going he's to break him, he's going to break him down. And so um, you play some of them and you go, oh, okay, I get it, now I see why this all happened and it all was, it's very interesting, it's very cool, but then there's the, I don't want to have more of the same. I think with that very first module, there was a lot of more of the same, and it was there was they they tied themselves to being very historically true, and in some of the later modules, like in the Men of Iron series, uh, I think they chose battles that have a unique puzzle to solve for each mm. battle, and it makes it more engaging and worth trying all of the battles. Um, the one big title SPQR, which is set in the Roman era. And really spans a couple of centuries of uh, leadership style and all the rest of it, and is, has tons and tons of supplemental battles from C3I magazines mm. and things like that. Every C3I magazine has an SP, uh, has a yeah. battle in it for Great Battles of History. So I, I I I started trying to find ways to link things together that made each battle interesting. So what what did it what did this mean in context of what was happened before and after, and not just, well I'm moving through all the battles in the scenario book because that's what I should do and I you have your favorites right everyone wants to play Kani everyone wants to uh, fight the battle of Phasalus and everyone wants to you know do uh, Alexander's Guagamala or whatever it is and because it's really seminal uh, conflict. <laughs> but if you look at some of the little things on either side uh, in the Second Punic War, there's some really interesting uh, little conflicts that went on and tons of different generals and they all have their own little histories and backgrounds. And so there's a campaign in one of the C3I magazines that's not linked 
you know, they don't take the results from one battle and give you the forces, the replacements, and how many guys you lost in the next one. It's a discrete setups. But you keep track of the battles, who won and who lost. And then you build up, you count up the number of points, and you can fight the Second Punic War, which is really cool. So, wow. you know, it goes over, I don't know, you know, 80 years, 50 years, or 30 years, or whatever it is. And there's, I played 23 out of the 25 battles, and um, they're just, yeah, it was just epic. You know, epic mm -hmm. in such a massively cool way that you're, you're like, okay, now I got this general because all those other suckers died. <laughs> right? They're all dead. Their all heads are on a spike somewhere. Um, and finally, you know, you have you've got uh, Africanus, you know, Scipio, or, or, uh, Africanus, uh, you know, you know, saves Rome and uh, and, de and defeats Hannibal. So there you go. Yeah. I, so I didn't answer the question, but I, I like to. I jump around a lot and mm. play two or three. With that series, the cool thing is, if you use the simple great battles of history rules you don't have to worry about learning the individual command rules for each module because each module's different. Yeah. Each module's slightly different because the error is different and they use different rules for each command. So does that help answer the question, maybe? Probably not, but... <laughs> <laughs> it makes me think of more questions, but... <laughs> well, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so then there's the simple great battles of history rule set that that everyone seems to prefer especially when it comes to the the command rules am i right uh, but then yeah. i thought gazina also did something different with that as well, well yeah, yeah it was I, I i mean like i said the issue was and i i i know i'm, I'm gonna get crucified for this <laughs> unfortunately whoever wrote the rules kind of in the simple battles of history, basically touches upon command in like two sentences. Right. Uh, and the only, I mean, and I played only Infidel before, and Infidel has a very interesting command structure which I really like. It's, uh, you know, how the turns work. And I was like, okay, if I read this correctly, then this is kind of really strange, so I'm go just gonna play it differently. But then I realized how it actually works. Mm -hmm. And I've been playing it like this ever since, and it actually works nicely. Um, I prefer SGBOH also because it plays more quickly. Right. Um, because there are so many things that you can do in GBOH, like if you have if you have javelineers, um, they can be low on ammunition once they have released their javelins, which makes sense. But you have the same for archers. You have the same for people who throw axes. You have so many people that can use ranged weapons and it's also very counter intensive. Mm -hmm. So um, I always, I, I'm saying to myself that I'm going to pick one battle that I really like and I'm going to try and play it using the other rules, the, the, the real GBOH rules to just have a comparison. But um, I mean, at the moment, Tom Kim takes me 45 minutes per turn. Each one has five turns. So that's like it never ends. But GBOH, SGBOH, you can you can play a battle in one to two, three hours max. Right. Um, and right. I I like about it that it's it really is fast. I mean, when you play some of those battles, it feels like you 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 can hear you can hear the armies walk past you. Right. Um, it's it's really gripping. Um, it is cool. And I think GBOH is for people who are much more experienced. Um, yeah, I, I think as as a beginner, if you know, well, not as a beginner, but as someone who's interested in war games and likes to wants to learn something about tactical ancients, I think mm. uh, the simple version gives you a really good feel. It gives you a lot of the the chrome and the guts of the game without all of the overhead, and it, mm. obviously, and it plays a lot faster. I I like to use the Great Battles of History command rules, and just use the simple Great Battles of History. Uh, rules for everything else. It works 95% of the time and it's near enough that I, I know I've played enough of the game that I don't think I'm bastardizing the history so badly that it's not representative of what, of what happened. And I still get a, a feel for it. Given that really we don't know factually, 100% yeah. accurately, anything that happened or how they really did it or, any, or you know how they really functioned in in uh, the cohorts and the legions and the commands and the line commands and how they changed from one pe era from the 
pre-Marian era, era to the post-Marian Marian, uh, Reformation era, uh, era. We don't know how all that mm. really worked. We can read mm -hmm. lots of books about it, and, and there's lots of conjecture and insight and yeah. research, but it's still, it's still one guy's opinion about someone's writings that were all politically motivated, right? It's like, so. it's like classical music. Like, we don't really know how it sounded back mm. when it was being played Baroque music. We just right. have to kind of make an educated guess by the evidence that we have, right. the documentation that we have. Um, so each turn in those tactical battles, uh, how many minutes or hours of real time or days do they represent? Oh, is it 20? I want to say it's an hour or 20 minutes or something like that. It's not a huge amount of time. I, don't, do I, have I think I read somewhere that sometimes it'll take you as long to play a battle of GBOH as the actual battle took. Yeah. Um, and that's and that the, the battles were actually quite short affairs. Um, yeah. Be because, you know, uh, even just, I mean, they were carrying around tons, I mean, really tons of equipment, you know, the Roman soldiers with their shields and, and, and it was just basically heavy armor walking around so they couldn't have sustained mm -hmm. longer longer engagement simply. Um, so I think, I think, um, I, I read somewhere that some of the infidel battles took like two hours tops. Right. Wow. <clears throat> Yeah, I think I think it's a variable time system. It depends on the on the on the module, but yeah, it's yeah. usually it's usually 20, 20, 30 minutes a turn or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seventy five meter hexes or one hundred and fifty meter hexes. I forget. I, I I don't remember now. But yeah, but small anyway. Small. Yeah, small. So yeah, it would be completely weird if a turn took longer to play than it actually happened in real in you know in, <laughs> in the context of the battle like here's a turn that represents 10 minutes of real time it takes me 45 minutes to play it that would be just weird yeah, well, you, you could you could always play the tactical combat system that's what that's like if you're playing Isn't 20 it? minute turns it takes well, an hour, no hour to play every turn it's ridiculous like how it doesn't seem like you have so much more time to contemplate uh, whereas in the heat of the battle you know things just happen Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. I think I think that that's one thing that uh, you, you you have this spectrum of the simpler games that we all play together, and then you have these simulations that are trying to be these uber exact representations of things, and they become so painful, and there's so much paperwork and rolling and chart checking and table lookups and things like that. That it, uh, after some point in time, you go, hmm, am I having fun? Do I, miss, or I don't think I am. This is this really kind of sucks. Uh, it's very accurate, but it sucks. <laughs> I'm three and a half minutes. Three hours later, am I having fun? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's often I'll sit in my little my little basement, you know, my little closet basement game room, and I'm sitting there. I'll look around, and it's cold, and it's two o'clock in the morning, and I'm like, I'm not having any fun. <laughs> Flip, <laughs> and that—that's when I start cursing who are the designer of the jour. You, you're making friends with them. I'm cursing them. So, <laughs> oh gosh. All right. Well, I have to go to a, uh, a flag football game and then a lacrosse game. Oh wow! Excellent. Well, okay. So, so we're probably going to need to wrap up in a second, but uh, that this was fun. I, I enjoy getting together and chatting, and I. Yeah. I uh, <laughs> I will um, try and work out this whole video thing. I, I've recorded this, but I'm just recording a portion of my PC screen, so I don't know how it's going to turn out. But uh, well, don't spill don't spill a drink on your game. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, just my computer that I'd be spilling the drink the, the drink on. We're safe. Uh, okay, cool. That's as long as it's not a game. So uh, no, no. so this was cool. Uh, we'll I'll I'll try and sort out. Maybe I'll uh, ping one in one of the two of you to try and work out this hangout thing live before we try, sure. try and do it next time. Uh, all right. All right. You're you're awesome. Thanks. Thanks for chatting. Bye. Ciao. Have a lovely day. You too. Bye. 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 -bye.